Yeah, I mean, and, and, you know, Larry emphasized, you know, the guy's brilliant, and he may be, but, you know, he's also very disruptive. Right. Uh, we have a I lot mean, of very brilliant, disruptive people right now. Yeah, <laughs> true. That's right. Oh, it's, I a good, it's a good thing, though, because the auto industry for many years had very undisruptive, non-brilliant people that were just sort of being caretakers and not pushing this stuff forward. That's right. I don't know if you want to talk at all about the story that came out in the information yesterday about Waymo's issues in Arizona and testing there, if you want to bring that sure. up. Sure. Yeah, we can get into that. We're going to have a, a broad discussion on autonomy. Yeah. And you saw uh, Waymo started... Uh, a subsidiary, whatever it's company in China. In China. Yeah, yeah. China. that's pretty interesting. Yeah, I'm sure it's, you know, they'll pro probably start testing there soon. They'll probably, I'm, I'm assuming they're probably going to partner up with somebody local there mm -hmm. for vehicles in that market. Although, you know, they could, they could use the Pacific as there too. They could, but wouldn't it be smarter to try and get a Chinese company on board? Yeah, they probably will. Save on shipping costs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was surprised they didn't use the name Waymo. It was like phonetically similar. Like it was like Wemo, H U I M O, wasn't it? Something like that. Something like that Picking yeah. up on WeChat, getting that We the the W I is probably more familiar to the Chinese. Mm -hmm. than Could way, be, yeah. Way. Yeah, everybody use WeChat there. They sure do, for everything. <laughs> yeah, I was just in Pittsburgh this week. Uh, you really? Yeah, for. Um, Kia. Kia. Kia Forte it was a drive program out there and uh, stayed right downtown in Pittsburgh. I had been in Pittsburgh for, I can't remember when, how many years. And Wow, that's really nice, nice it's downtown area. It's a changing area. city. It's, it's Absolutely. Quite, the thing that it sort of was, was a little bit, <laughs> was the hotel we were staying at was right across the street from the former headquarters of Alcoa. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and, you stayed you know, at the William, Omni William Penn. No, we stayed at the uh, Kimpton, the oh, Hotel okay. Monaco. Kimpton. But you know, but the thing was, is as you know, I mean, that building has very interesting architecture, and it it looks sort of like it could be made out of aluminum almost. And uh, that was the idea. And so, I noticed that at the very top there is still the logo of Alcoa, but it it's it's it's, it's weathered. Yeah. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> And you know now the building is is apartments and condos and and uh, some uh, retail on the on the main yeah. floor. And I was thinking, wow, what a change from you know one of the world's leading suppliers of aluminum to a mixed use yes. facility. Well, Pittsburgh is in a state of change as well. Yeah. It's right. not as fast as Detroit because there's not as much money coming into it. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's the medical and uh, the robotics. And, and it was just it was just striking the the classic architecture that's still in that city. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. It's beautiful. Okay. I want to thank everybody who's already tuned in live. We're going to have a very interesting discussion all about autonomous cars. We have David Shutt from the SAE with us. If you would like to ask him questions during the course of the show, you can contact us several ways. The easiest is send us an email and shoot that to viewer mail at autoline.tv or you can call in too. And that number is 620-288-6546. And we'd recommend keep your question short if you do call in. Sometimes we've had people who have rambled on and on, and uh, we don't like that. If you keep it short, it's much more likely to get on the show. And by the way, are you following AutoLine on social media? We've got a lot out there right there. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. Just look for the AutoLine Network. At Twitter, just look for at AutoLine. On Instagram, it's at Autoline Network. We love hearing from you, our viewers. So check out the viewer mail section of our website, autoline.tv. You're going to find my answers to your questions and comments that you guys send in. And there's a lot of great information in the viewer mail section. Okay, we're going to get going with the show in just a moment. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems, and by Borg Warner. 
propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy-efficient world. All right, everybody, welcome to AutoLine After Hours, especially welcome to my co-host. John, how are you? I'm doing great. Good to hear. Good to hear. You, you, you were traveling this week, huh? Yeah, I went in, uh, to, to Pittsburgh, where our guest is, is from, or located in presently. And, and we'll uh, introduce him the, in a minute. But drove the uh, 2019 Kia Forte. Which, thumbs up, uh, thumbs down. You know, for a compact car, these guys really put a lot into this third generation vehicle. I mean, it was, they, they over indexed mm -hmm. on, on this car in some ways. And because uh, you came back from the, the Hyundai Santa Fe thing saying you were really impressed by that vehicle. Yeah. Yeah. So, so here we have the Hyundai Motor Group. I mean, both of these companies and, uh, but what's interesting about the Forte, I think, is the fact that, um, you know, as, as we've heard from Honda, if we, as we've heard from Toyota, that they're not giving up on sedans and, and that was the same, same message from Kia. And, uh, um, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting going forward. I mean, as we've, we've heard Ford saying, you know, they're going to back off on sedans and, and here are some companies that, that still think that if they can give a handsome performance oriented yet economical vehicle that, uh, they're going to, they're going to sell lots of them. So, um, that's actually, it was interesting and we'll leave it alone after this, but, but the Forte is actually Kia's number one selling vehicle. So it outsells its crossovers. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Okay. We'll have to keep an eye on those sales. But we got to let everybody know Sam Abulsamid from Navigant Research is with us here today. And Sam, always great having you on the show. It's always great to be back here with you guys. Always, always vibrant conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and our special guest for today's show is David Shutt. He is the CEO of SAE International, the Society of Automotive Engineers. And David, great having you on After Hours. Thanks for the opportunity to be here, John. The reason I wanted to have you on here is you guys did a very interesting, I don't know if experiment is the right word or demonstration is the right word, but uh, I'll just sort of lay the groundwork and have you fill in the details. But you were able to put members of the public in autonomous cars and survey them ahead of time and afterwards, and you found a dramatic difference. So you take sure, it from there. Sure. Well, hey, the, the whole world of autonomous and connected vehicles, it's exciting, right? The industry's focusing on it, and we're going to put some great cars together. But we also have to have a public that's willing to get in them. And uh, what we're finding is that the, the, the activities that are going on, the, the news coverage, creating some anxiety within the public. And so what is the right way to go through this? So we want to ask the public themselves. That's a new domain space for SA International. But what we put together was an interesting combination of uh, test vehicles. So we had to have our technology providers in there. And we need to find an environment where we could do this. Policymakers who are open to it, uh, municipalities who could allow this. And we put that together. And then you also had to have a curious and even adventurous public to get in. And as you said, we interviewed before and after. And uh, what we found was, you know, obviously, it's going to be adopters who want to try it. Uh, but even after that, they were even more positive about the experience. Uh, and we're from a 92-year-old a man. He comes in, and he says, you know, this is America. This is what we're supposed to do. And he was so excited to be a part of this next revolution. We had a woman who was eight months pregnant getting in. And she says, ah, it was a little jittery, a little jumpy, because it was over over analyzed to avoid obstacles but she came back after she's this would be such an amazing thing for me so you so did this in tampa florida on tampa. On, on city, on, on city the, highway the or, highways yep. but you got them to shut down the highway they shut so down you're the, the only car out there right well obviously the safety is important mm -hmm. but as i said that municipality and the the, the legislators the policymakers were open to having us do that. That's a, a critical part. So it wasn't, it wasn't difficult for you guys to convince them that, mm. that you're going to, I mean, um, tell, us about, tell us about that. I mean, so, so here are you guys coming and saying, hey, we want to put a car without a driver on the road. And they're like thinking, oh my goodness, what's uh, going to happen? The thing is, though, that some of the policymakers down there, wanna, they, they want to move this forward. And we're going to have to have some testing. We're going to have to experiments, but we're going to do it in a safe way. Um, it, these vehicles are already being tested on the road. Some of them are, but in these cases, they're further out. We had pilots in them, so they weren't completely un, unmanned. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, yeah, they were there, and the, the legislators and the municipality people came down themselves. How, how'd you settle on Tampa? Um, early adapters. We were talking to several different cities and areas, and they were the ones that were able to put it all together and say, we're going to get this done. Mm -hmm. So it's really alignment of those, you know, the providers 
and, and the, the, the environment in which we're going to do it. So, you know, I, I, I think some of the viewers may be familiar with SAE from the point of view that whenever we talk about the levels of autonomy, sure. it's the SAE levels yep. that, that, that you guys have basically created. Could you, could you talk to us about that a little bit? I mean, to... to because that's just that has recently just been updated as well. You've uh, added some not, more, not, some more detail to it. Yeah, both that, but also made to be understood by the general public. Right. The, the first version was for developing that common taxonomy, or just the language amongst engineer to engineer, uh, and how we put that together. And you know, level zero is most of the cars we all learn to drive on. Level five, right, fall asleep and you end up where you need to be. And we're progressing through that. And right now we're up to about level two. Uh, and what we're really pleased by, it's becoming a marketing conversation. We have a level two car, we're shooting for level three. But it's been important to create some type of harmony and a common language. And so the public is excited about getting out to a level four and a level five. And what we did find in the, in the, the Tampa study, and, and it was a small data set, we intend to do it in other places, but the majority of the people actually feel uncomfortable with the concept of a solely human-driven car. They actually prefer uh, a human-computer partnership. So there's actually more interest in going forward than going backwards. So when, when you say, you know, partnership of a human and machine-driven car, would, would that imply that they're more interested in, in something where the, the technology can help to augment the driver as opposed to take over from the driver? Because, I mean, that's, that's an idea that's sure. been thrown around there of late is, yeah, and, and Toyota does, you know, talks about this with their, their Guardian approach to partial automation where the, the system acts as kind of envelope protection uh, for the driver to make sure that if the driver is doing something that is going to get into an unsafe situation, then it'll protect against that and keep them in a safe zone as opposed to completely taking over the driving task. I think we probably thought through that far more than the general public. Uh, but I do think they recognize that the more automated it can become, the safer it is. But when you have those conversations with them, talk about it, then they begin to understand the same challenges we have. You've got a mixture of vehicles, and that creates a complex dynamic. But I think they are willing to go more towards an automated environment. We had uh, one gentleman, uh, apparently was in a, a bad automobile accident as a young child, and he said if this technology existed then, that wouldn't have happened. And he's really excited about someday having his five-year-old and eight-year-old being picked up at school and being brought home. So he was a very optimistic person about this. Well, let's go back to Tampa. Sure. Uh, I see from the videos you were using Ford Fusions. Where'd you get them from? Uh, again, there were the, the technology partners who were willing to engage with us and, and bring the vehicles down. It's important to get the vehicles down there. It's expensive. It's an investment that they make. But it's, it's not just the vehicle. It's also the technicians around it to make sure it's sure. operating. It was not Ford, was it? No. Okay. I, Renaissance? Because I know they've been working with uh, Ford Fusions. Um, Might be. Yeah, okay. So you, you get uh, Tampa to say, yep, we'll close down. You get this technology provider, yep, we're going to have autonomous cars there. How did you get members of the public to sign up to get in them? Uh, we put out uh, public messages that, they were gonna be, that we were going to be down there. People signed up, and we had very long waiting lists. That was what the exciting part about this. A lot of people wanted to try it. They stood in long lines to participate. Now, how, how many people went through it? Um, about 300. No kidding. So was it a day That's long? That's a lot. That, that was how many people signed up, and, and we, it, it took time to get through all the people. Um, I apologize, I forget the exact number that went through it, but I know we had over a 300-person interest coming into it. Now, it's kind of self-selecting. I mean, uh, sure. these are people who say, hey, I want to go in yeah. one of these. If you're things. fearful of it, you're not going to get in line. <laughs> you're not. But, and yet, you surveyed them ahead of time and what the yeah. survey. Everyone went through it. And it, what we wanted to find out is what they thought in advance versus afterwards. Mm -hmm. And again, early adopter, they're excited about it. But what, the, what we found at the end is they were even more enthusiastic about it. What anxieties they may have had were, were less, uh, or their curiosity questions were answered. What, what surprised them and what did not surprise them? I mean, what, what kind of reactions did you get from these people is what I'm getting at. Um, I think the wow factor was the biggest reaction. It's like, wow, this really works. This can really happen. This can really change the way things take place. Hmm. Were, were there any people who came out of the car and said, last time I do that? Um, not that I'm aware of. Hmm. I wasn't on site when it took place, mm -hmm. but that is not the feedback that came in through me. 
Now, th this, this first program you did in Tampa was on a closed off section of freeway. Was there, was there any city streets or just the just this freeway just section? The freeway. So for future events that you're planning, are you also looking at getting into some more urban driving situations, uh, more, more challenging scenarios than than a, a closed-off sure. section of freeway? I think we need to do that over time. As we gain experience doing this on a, on a public testing, what works, what they're comfortable with doing, and again, it's going to become the municipality that you work with and the technology and, it, and our comfort level with it. Whoops, i got to interrupt here. Joe Laszlo wrote in to say, John, Lincoln's probably not very happy that you're calling those cars fusions. <laughs> oh. I guess they're MKZs. It was, yeah, it was MKZs. <laughs> but but the, the fusion and Thanks MKZ that, hybrids are, are commonly used by a lot of the companies, especially startups, that are developing these systems because they're, they're readily available and, and for, they're fairly well known as far as where to tap in to get power and everything. So they're, they're, they're widely used by a lot of companies. Mm -hmm. So, David, why did SAE do this? I mean, you're, you're an organization that, that creates standards for everything that goes in an automobile. I think, you know, to the, to the smallest fastener, you guys probably have a right. standard about that. And, and to, to say, okay, this is advanced automotive technology and, and we, we're going to get behind this in a, in a different way than perhaps we got behind, I don't know, automatic transmissions, let's say. I mean, what was behind the thinking? There's a need. Right? We're, we're certainly working within the automotive technical community to develop those standards, but there's that big unanswered question by the public. And, and the OEs are doing a lot of their own research, but even that, you're going to have to begin to say, first, they may not want to share all of it, uh, com competitive interest. So we've always been an area where it's pre-competitive, where we can bring all the different voices together. And what we want to do is really build out that public's interest. And we believe the data set as we build it and grow it will become very valuable back into the OEs as well as the policymakers. Mm -hmm. Geez, I would hope all the OEs would be running to SAE and say, let's do this at every auto show. I mean, because all the surveys show in the United States, 80% of the public is very wary of autonomous vehicles. And if we maintain that level of wariness, this technology is going nowhere. We will have lots of conversations with the partners who want to help us do that. Uh, it, was, it was, as you said, it was new for us. It was initial foray. It was an experiment. And we got some pretty good positive results and experience from it. So we're looking for how do we expand that. You know, I thought it was sort of interesting. You did this in Tampa um, this, this past spring. And a few weeks after you did that, there was the, the Uber accident. And uh, so AAA, which is, oddly enough, based in Orlando, Florida, did a, did a survey and uh, found that uh, three quarters, 73% of uh, U.S. drivers were said they'd be too afraid to drive in a fully self-driving vehicle, which was up six, from 63% in late 2017. I mean, there was a there was a a, a 10 point shift. Wow. But I think what you're seeing is is that your experience of actually putting people in these vehicles for real versus somebody speculatively saying. You know, I think I'd be afraid to ride in a spaceship, you know, something they've never done before. But if you rode in a spaceship, maybe you wouldn't be afraid. Let's get real data and real experiences, right, versus just anxiety being, being played out. And that's the part. Uh, and I think over time, as we have more experiences with individuals, maybe some of those who are a little bit less excited about it be willing to try it. Mm -hmm. And I think we, what we need to do in our next steps is actually seek those people out and say, we'd like to engage you in this, rather than just have an open call. Mm -hmm. And of course now, you know, earlier this month at the management briefing seminars in Traverse City, your colleague Frank Mancheca uh, announced SAE was going to start a uh, process of developing some standardized testing procedures okay. to, to help with evaluating these systems, uh, because right now there are no standards for how we test these. And that's, that's been one of the big things that SAE has done over the years, is developing testing standards, not necessarily what what the target is of what's good or bad, but you know, how, do we, how do we test them consistently so we can compare our different systems? Sure. Procedures, protocols, exactly. And, and um, that initiative is progressing quite a bit. You know, NHTSA has, has called on the industry to help us understand how to do this. And so we're responding to that mandate. And we have a, a consortium of OEs right now that are in that, the beginning stages of forming that pre-competitive roadmap. What are those areas where, as an industry, we need to collaborate on, collaborate with policymakers, collaborate with other stakeholders. And so we're putting that initial framework together, and I have every expectation that 
safety testing is going to be one of those first things that we got to knock down and get figured out properly. So again, we'll we'll do that with the performance base rather than prescriptive approach. Uh -huh. are, are you finding that there is is greater interest in SAE by organizations and companies that you would have never dreamed would be would be uh, yeah uh, if you asked me that question 10 years ago versus absolutely right I mean it's uh, the way I look at this you know if you look at one of SAE's strengths has always been powertrain right there is an ecosystem for the powertrain that if something new technology comes along or a new regulation the whole system vibrates in, in harmony to solve that problem in this autonomous and connected vehicle there isn't an ecosystem yet and so we have to help create those nodes in that network. But what's even more exciting about it is there's a whole new set of players. And they, we are having, SAE is getting a lot of market pull from these technology companies. They're looking for additional pathways into this entire ecosystem. And so there's a strong market pull to get us. And that actually is encouraging by our traditional partners as well, uh, because they know that could become a, uh, a mechanism by which they engage in an effective way, a known, a comfortable way, mm -hmm. uh, through our organization. And, and you know, we've had more new players enter the, the transportation space in the last five years than we've probably had in the last 50, you know, in terms of companies developing everything from sensors to computing technologies and software. So, you know, to, to find ways to connect, you know, the, the established players and the new players to get them, to help them collaborate is probably a good thing, I would say. Yeah, and they're looking for a way not to approach one technology or one provider, they're looking to, to, to contribute into the system. And, and we're also finding that those new players are also approaching our organization in that white hat, that neutral forum as well, that mm -hmm. they're looking for a mechanism to, to participate in the collective ecosystem rather than drive a in individual technology or solution. Mm -hmm. They well, recognize to, what we do. So, so to go back to John's question, is, is there anything that surprised, surprises you about some of these new companies and, and their approach to the traditional auto industry? Their eagerness to partner. They are very excited to find ways in to have those conversations mm -hmm. and they're willing to contribute not just take. <laughs> One of the concerns w around a lot of the, the newer players, and I, I, I personally have in the last nine to 12 months have, have seen a, a shift in this, but one of the concerns has been, um, you know, the willingness to take shortcuts, you know, especially by players, you know, that are new to the automotive industry. Um, you know, is this something that you're talking to them about, you know, trying to discourage them from, from taking those shortcuts, you know, to, to really focus on the safety and make sure they do it right? Sure. That's been a part of our DNA and our culture from the beginning is, is public safety. Um, and we are a neutral forum. We're not going to allow any one organization or one company get a competitive advantage out of it. And so we do challenge and push back, and we want to make sure all the stakeholders' voices are being heard and, and contributing to the conversation. Are you involved inter globally, internationally? Absolutely. I mean, and, and so, are, are the, you know, tell us about that. In, we, in are, uh, we have operations around the world, whether it be in Europe, China, Japan. Uh, so we engage the entire globe into our, our, our system. The aerospace industry is, has been global from its inception. So we have a, a very long global network there. In the, aerospace, or in the automotive industry, um, China's actively involved with our activities. Europe, we're in conversation with a lot of the test tracks, uh, same conversation we'd be having in the United States. This whole process of harmonization is, is newer to the automotive industry. If you compare it to the aerospace industry from the beginning, a plane that took off in Detroit, went to London, went to Nagoya, it had to follow all those rules. The car grew up regionally, hmm. but now we're operating globally. So this, this is a new muscle as, a, as an industry, as a policy-making community we have to get to. And, and SA has been able to play a harmonization factor in all of that. It's, we, it's, we, I was going to say, we, we got a number of questions coming in here from the audience. Lost in the Curve wants to know if your uh, Tampa demonstration is different than what Waymo and Uber have been doing. Um, I would say yes. Uh, we are agnostic on the technology, but pro on the the accomplishments and what, what's taking place. Uh, we're doing it in partnership uh, with the, the policy making community to learn. 
rather than drive a business. We want to contribute back to the whole. Jeff Taylor wants to know, when does SAE estimate that autonomous ride sharing will become mainstream and private ownership of autonomous vehicles will happen? Uh, SAE doesn't take a, a, a position on that one. I think that's a, a personal guess on anyone's part right now. Mike Flowers wants to know, what are SAE's thoughts on plug-in versus induction charging? We're not going to pick the technology. But you're setting the standards, well, the charging standards, the plugs and all that, right? Um, we are establishing the standards, right? It's the industry that comes in underneath us and helps us develop those standards. So we're not going to pick the technology. I think the marketplace will decide that. Joe Laszlo wants to know, what needs to be upgraded in our infrastructure to support AV fleets? Telecommunications is going to be one of those things, for sure. Car to car and car, car to, to infrastructure. Car, all that. And, and again, we're going to be looking at the standards we're working with is the performance-based. You know, how, how do we make sure the latency is right, all those other aspects to be safe. So, mm -hmm. so do telecommunication companies work with SAE? That is a, you know, as, as you look at the, the IEEE's of this world, right, they've been working in that space a lot. Now it's a new application, so what can we learn and how can we leverage those technologies? So short answer is yes, they are engaging with our standards committees. We need for, that. We need that expertise. Mm -hmm. for, for the viewers out there that aren't familiar with the SAE standards process, can you just give a brief overview of kind of how that works? How, you know, I mean, is SAE kind of this... I know it, but you know, is SAE this kind of ivory tower organization that sets the standards and pushes them out, or, or how, how? Give us a brief description of that. We're the, we're the neutral convener, and what we want to make sure is all the stakeholders are involved, whether it's the technology ex experts, it's the policymakers if they really have an important part, or the, the stakeholders, the public. And so we're the spot where, where the, the problem is identified, and the community that's the experts around it help create those standards. Uh, we have about 45,000 standards. You mentioned earlier, 45,000 standards across the automotive and the aerospace industry. And these were created by people in the industry who came to SAE. And true stakeholders. So uh, SAE is the framework by which this takes place. Uh, we have experts from around the world. So when you identify one of those areas where you think a standard might be needed, you establish a committee and anyone that's a stakeholder can come in and, and participate in that process, the discussion process, drafting the, the, the voting on the, the ultimate standard. And Correct. And we have you know, procedures that we follow so that the, the output, you can be assured, has gone through a, a two-step process, a technology review, a policy review, and all of our standards comply with World Trade Organization protocols of being open, balanced, consensus-based. And that's why so many of our standards find their way in the regulatory process. That's not the objective of our standards, but many of them do find their way into the regulatory process. The lighting standards, for example, are, are used throughout U.S. and Canada. So you mentioned harmonization earlier. Um, that's always been a, a real issue for the auto industry because we have so many different regulations in every different country, different regions of the world, and trying to de design cars to meet these sometimes conflicting regulations. We've got an opportunity now with autonomous technology where there aren't really any regulations in place at this point. Um, are, you know, are you seeing that regulators in different countries are perhaps more willing than in the past to maybe um, be part of this process of harmonizing the, the regulations so we can have perhaps a common set of regulations globally? There's a recognition for the need, but there's still a legacy of regional behaviors. Uh, and then you've got the rise of a new entrant, right? China. Uh -huh. we, we had so many regulations put in place well before, and now China wants to play an important role. And what we're finding is that they are very willing to participate in the process. They still want to make sure theirs goes forward uh, within China, but they need they recognize the need to play on a global basis. So again, it's a, it's a new muscle that's being developed within the, the automotive and the ground vehicle industry. We got some, uh, some more comments and questions from the uh, audience here. Moses Fridman says, will the public buy AVs? No, they won't for many years because there's no sign yet of an affordable L4 or L5 AV. These are still very expensive research prototypes. Hey, never say never. Technology is, is transforming so much of our lives and we'll get it right. Uh, more time, more experience. I, I would also yeah. add that uh, the first AVs are likely to be ride hailing service cars owned by fleets. And when you start to use lots of people in it, 
now the technology becomes affordable. You get a larger data set, right, to make sure it is safe, and then you get the economies of scale. Absolutely. You know, what's, what's interesting about that question is the L4 and the L5 are the SAE. Correct. Level 4 and Level 5, so. Big Barney says, how much uh, uh, better than a driver does an AV have to be to achieve to be mainstream? And then Chuck Grenchy wrote in, says, I think autonomous will need to reach the status of air travel or better before it becomes mainstream. And I think what he means is the air, uh, in terms of air safety. safety record, which yeah. is quite good in the airline industry. Absolutely, and, and SA is proud to be a part of that safety record within the aerospace around quality, et cetera. Um, you know, I, we're going to have to get to a critical mass of autonomous vehicles on the road uh, to, the, to get this to work. You can't have just a lone actor, but we're always going to have the lone level zero car as well. So we're going to have to build a very redundant, very robust system. Uh, but as there are more cars out there, there will be more optimization of how this can work. Mm -hmm. It's coming. It, yeah. so, it will come. It's, it's, it's more a question of when, not if. Yeah. 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 So, so I, have a, I have a slightly different question. Okay, you're, you're an engineering society mm -hmm. consisting of engineers. How, how is that working out with young people? Are young people interested in becoming automotive engineers? If you expose them, they can get really excited about it. Um, if, if you don't expose them, they may and assume by expose them, you mean to engineering challenges to, and yeah, what the they can exciting, be doing? I mean, and the, the amount of optimization that needs to, if you're a controls engineer, the amount of optimization and the amount of sensors that are going on in a vehicle right now that have to get it to make, it's phenomenal. If you're a software engineer, how many lines of code are in a car? Um, everyone understands a car. We need to make sure they understand that it, it's an exciting opportunity. And I think when you expose it, they come. And the, the thing about engineering, you know, science is all about understanding how the world around you works. Engineering is about taking that knowledge and applying it to solving problems. And, you know, we've got real problems that need solving. And, you know, I think people like to solve problems. That's, that's always, I think that's always been the case. You know, and now we have some fascinating new new challenges, new ways for, for people to get involved with that problem solving. It's not solely about optimization anymore. Yeah. Eventually we have to get to the out, but we got, as you said, problems. Yeah, we've got, I mean, we've got fundamental things to figure out still with, with this technology that, that's going to take some time. And, you know, there's a lot of opportunities for, for you know, some interesting challenges. There sure are. With that, we're going to wrap up this section uh, of the show, but uh, David, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. Real, real, real pleasure having you here. Kudos to the SAE for doing this, too. And, boy, I hope you guys take this all over the country because the more people that get exposed to this technology and see what it can do, that's going to change the public's perception Absolutely. of it. That's the data set that we need to create and share and learn from. Good well, deal. Thanks a lot. Yeah, no, like I said, thank, thank you, SAE, for doing what you're doing. Our pleasure. Real good. Okay, we're going to take a quick commercial break right now and give a shout out to our friends at Borg Warner. The world is changing at an ever increasing pace. No matter what the mode of transportation, there is always the need for an efficient propulsion system. And that's exactly what Borg Warner has been doing since the earliest days of the automotive industry. We create innovative mobility technologies that reduce energy consumption and emissions while improving performance. Our proven track record has made us an industry leader in forward-looking propulsion solutions for combustion, hybrid, and electric vehicles. Okay, we're back talking all things automotive on After Hours, but this is the time of the show where we bring Dr. Data. Okay, so... We're, we're going to mix it up a little bit this time, okay? So, so it's as it's, opposed to just mixing us up. <laughs> it's 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 going to it's it's going to be far easier, okay, for you to to do this. You might even so, guess it. So 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 it's it's going to be a series of of things. So so Katie, could you please bring the the first uh, image up? So this is a percentage of people who are using the Internet of Things. Okay, so as you well know, that uh, more and more products are getting IP addresses, they're getting internet protocol addresses in them. And so this could be everything from a toaster to... Your doorbell. So, to your so doorbell to a Percentage of people that are actively doing it or a percentage of people that are doing it whether they know it or not? The people who are, who are actually saying, yes, I'm using the internet of things. Okay, okay and so this is, this is on a global basis. So what is the percentage 
of people using the Internet of Things. So the choices are 14 percent, 28 percent, 52 percent, or 73 percent. Correct. And this is what people are telling... There's a, a firm, uh, Dynatrace, that, that did this, this survey over um, a reasonable number of people. I'm going to say 14 percent. 14, one four. John? Yeah, well, just to be different, I'll say 28 percent. And Katie, bring up the answer, please. 52 huh? percent. So basically, there's a lot of a lot of activity, a lot of embedded things that are going on in in this world. Okay. See, I'm suspicious. Okay. Of the public. I don't even know if the public knows. Yeah, it, well, it depends I think, a lot on what the question was and, and how it was asked. Well, let's just say that. <laughs> That's you, why I asked. You know, I mean, is it people that are using it, whether they know it or not, or people that are you know well, actively you're not, if you think that you're using it. if you didn't know you were using it, then why would you say you're using it? So let's just no. assume that these people knew. Okay. So. Let's bring up the next set of data points here. There's another set. So the people having problems using the Internet of Things. I'll say 95%. Oh, I'm with Sam. 95%. <laughs> Boy, you guys were really quick on that. So actually, the actual answer is 64%. A lot better than I expected. Yeah. Okay, so, so why, is, why is this at all interesting? Why did I bring this number up? What does this number have to do with, with anything And in this goes to the point of, of the show that we've just been talking about. And it just, it just seems that because of the Internet of Things, and you, know, so you have a lot of people using it, right? We've established that with the first set of numbers, and now we've got this, that people are having problems with it. And as a consequence of that, and this is a rather surprising discovery to me, so Katie, bring up the last number. 84% say they won't use self-driving cars as a result of that because they are afraid that there's going to be a problem with the vehicle because they are having problems with their doorbell, with their toaster, with their whatever. Because yeah. I mean, all these cars are going to be IoT devices. Right. You know, they're all connected, and and they have to be in order to function. Mm -hmm. So, so that's I mean that's that's I, I I think that's more astonishing than the 95 percent that you guys thought were having problems with it. Yeah. But I mean it's it's a big number. No, that is a big number, and uh, you know every survey shows that. And it's interesting to see uh, regional differences, geographic differences. Chinese people are way more embracing of this technology than Americans. And I find that to be an amazing cultural shift where Chinese people are more interested in new technology than Americans are. But as we saw with SAE's demonstration program in Tampa, you can flip that very quickly. I, as I've said many, many times over the years now, of course people are leery of autonomous cars. Most of them have never seen one. They've absolutely never been in one, and they don't understand the technology. Right, and then they I have no idea it. what it's capable of or not capable of. Right. right. So the first time somebody said, get on a roller coaster, you probably thought they were insane yeah. and uh, that you would you know, immediately die. But after you took a ride, it's like... <laughs> I've got a great picture, and we should bring it up for a show here sometime, of uh, it's 1927, and there's this big, you know, biplane, and people lined up to get into it. And the big mobility services startup of the day was Pan Am. Hmm. And you look at this plane, and I'm not sure I'd get on that plane, but people were lined up to get on it. And today we get on a plane like we get on a bus. We don't give it a second thought. And I, that's how it's going to go with autonomous cars, only much faster than it did with the airlines. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as, as David mentioned, there's, there's an increasing number of, of companies that are, that are getting really deeply involved in this whole autonomous thing. And, and this week we uh, saw the announcement that uh, Toyota Motor Corp, the home country Motor Corp uh, for Toyota, and Uber are going to collaborate on yeah. uh, autonomous driving and, and uh, in fact, Toyota be, put a half a billion dollars into Uber, right, which is in addition to a billion dollars that they invested a couple yeah. of years ago. So right. they already had a significant. Sam, what do you make right. of this? I mean, Uber's doing its own AV stuff, right? But mm -hmm. Toyota's doing its own AV stuff. Well, I, I think I think it actually makes a lot of sense for both companies. Um, for for Uber in particular, that you know, ever since the the crash in March that, that killed the pedestrian in Arizona, they've been struggling. You know, their management's been struggling trying to figure out, okay, what do, what are we going to do with this program? Do we proceed down the path we were going uh, and try to develop a complete system on our own and deploy it in vehicles that we own? Or do we shut it down or do we find a partner? And I think the, the, what they've done here you know, with partnering with, with Toyota actually is probably the best possible solution for them. 
because it gives them a partner that both has an excellent reputation for quality and safety, you know, things that Uber probably somewhat lacks, you know, they're, they're, Toyota is seen as a, tr people trust Toyota for the most part, um, which does not necessarily apply in the case of Uber. So working with them, I think, will, will be good. It will also um, give them a place where they can deploy their technology without necessarily, you know, what they, what they, they and they, as far as we know, they still have a deal with Volvo to buy some Volvo vehicles and put their technology on that and, and deploy those. Whether that goes ahead uh, will, remains to be seen. Uh, my guess is it probably won't. Um, but And then for Toyota, this also makes sense because one of the things that companies are going to have to do with, with these systems as they start to deploy them is they need redundancy uh, and diversity in the system. So that means that they need to have multiple kinds of sensors, uh, but they also need multiple types of software in the vehicles that are running in parallel and can cross-check each other to make sure that you know, they're making the right decisions about what to do. You know, companies like Aptiv, you know, they, one of the reasons why they bought Newtonomy last year is, you know, they want to run both Newtonomy's self-driving algorithm and their own stuff that they had already developed with their other division, Automatica, uh, have those running together. Other companies are doing similar, similar types of things. For Toyota, they have their Guardian system that they're, they've been developing, and they're going to have the Uber uh, software and they can combine that in the vehicle and then have basically an arbitrator that looks to make sure that they agree on what should be done you know as it moves forward so it should be it should end up ultimately being a safer system and you know it'll be to put it on you know, on Volvo's Sienna minivans which is the first platform they're going to put it on Toyota's not Volvo's sorry <laughs> Toyota's Sienna minivans yeah um, you know that for a mobility service vehicle that makes more sense really than you know a Volvo SUV anyway right. See, and that's why back I, my prediction that the minivan is going to come back as oh, result of autonomy yeah. it's it's yeah it's the no question it's the it's the vehicle design of choice that mm -hmm. uh, but you know it seems sort of odd to me that you know I mean I, I understand the point of that you know you want to have like your software is running and my software is running and we're we're both doing something that doesn't seem to be rather complicated I mean isn't it historically yeah I don't even think it's so much about the technology I think Toyota recognizes man we're way behind and Uber it, when it comes to ride sharing and Uber realizes to your point Sam wow we're way behind when it comes to autonomy put the two together and bang they jump maybe not to the front of the class but way farther ahead than had where they had been mm -hmm. yeah so so since since you you really cover autonomy closely, Sam. Um, I mean, do you see going forward that companies are going to have to do this? I mean, does does Waymo do this, or does this Waymo just use the Waymo system? Uh, Waymo uses the Waymo system, but they actually have multiple algorithms running internally in, right. in their system as well. So they have a, di a diversity of, of software. You know, so they've got one they've got one component in there that's looking you know looking at what the sen what the sensor signals, looking for the targets. You know, looking for other other cars, other pedestrians, cyclists, and so on. And then the second algorithm is looking for the empty spaces in between. Mm -hmm. And then those two have to match up. And if they don't, you know, if if one algorithm says there's an empty space there, and the other one says no, there's a pedestrian there, then you know there's a problem. Right. Um, so yeah, every, everybody is is and working on start going around yeah, the solutions. Does not compute. Does not compute. Yeah. Like, yeah. Pretty much. Know, like on Lost yeah, in Space. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and then it just stops halfway through the uh, halfway through a left turn, mm -hmm. um, which is you know one of the other uh, stories that came up this week. Uh, the information. Um, had a report on, uh, they, they actually went out, their, one of their writers went to Chandler and talked to people living in the area where Waymo So this Waymo's is where Waymo's running, running its uh, driverless fleet out there. Yeah, that's, yeah, Waymo's got several hundred vehicles running around there. It's where they've been doing their early rider program for the past year. Mm -hmm. and they've got about 400 families that are involved in that, in actually riding daily in these vehicles. Um, and they talked to people in the area and they heard a lot of complaints from various people about the way these cars drive, you know, that, you know, sometimes, you know, they'll halfway through a turn, it'll just stop and wait, you know, while it's trying to figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so far, you know, none of their vehicles have actually 
uh, at least none of, you know, not since uh, a crash in Mountain View a couple of years ago, none of their vehicles have been involved in any incidents that were caused by the vehicle. So they're clearly erring on the side of safety. But it is annoying other, other drivers and, and other people in the area the way these vehicles are behaving. So it's, you know, it's not perfect by any means, but, mm -hmm. you know, they'll, they'll continue to get better. So, John, if you lived in Chandler, would you... Uh avail yourself of Absolutely. the service. Absolutely. No yeah. question about it. But, but, you know. But you like to drive and you'd get in one of these things? Well, well let know, me ask I, you this, love... John. Would, would you go online and order your groceries at Walmart and then wait for a Waymo car to come pick you up to take you to Walmart to pick up your grocery order and then bring you home again? That I probably wouldn't do. But I don't know anybody who loves their daily commute. I've never met no, anybody no. who loves their daily commute. That's a perfect application for autonomy. And with traffic congestion only getting worse, I can see once people recognize that, oh my gosh, I can do whatever I want in my car in this bloody stop and go traffic, they're gonna want autonomy. Okay, August 30th, 2018, would you drive in an autonomous vehicle as your daily driver? Not someday, today. Yeah, today, absolutely, absolutely. But I, I wouldn't do just anybody. Uh, would I get in a Waymo vehicle? Absolutely. Would I get in a GM Cruise one? Absolutely. Uh, would I without a safety driver? Without a safety driver, I'd get in that right now. Sure, I would. Reckless man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, as as we heard earlier, you know, from the the event they did in Tampa, you know, particularly um, elderly riders, you know, were very interested. Um, in this technology because it does provide a, a degree of mobility, you know, a, a, degree of, a degree of freedom in getting around that, you know, as you get older and, you know, your eyesight starts to go, your reflexes start to go, you, you can't drive safely or if you're young or... You, you never notice that though. So until, but, some, or, until somebody takes your license, yeah, then, then, or, then you've got or, the issue. You know, if you're blind, you know, for, for somebody who's blind, the, the ability to get around on your own without having to rely on somebody else you know, I think it's going to be them. it's going to be a huge boon. There's still a lot of issues to resolve in the specific logistics of how you do that. Yeah. But you know, they'll get there. Yeah. All right. On a completely different subject, um, but still in the technology realm. So, so Dyson, the maker of vacuum cleaners that we all know so well, and now they do hair, hair dryers as well. Has very expensive ones at that. Very expensive ones has has basically a couple of years ago that they said that they were going to be investing 2.6 billion dollars on developing an electric vehicle. And they still seem to be on this glide path of having an electric vehicle by 2021. Now this week they announced that they're gonna be building a test track, assuming they get approval, which they're putting like $110 million in at some airfield. So is, is Dyson going to become the next Tesla? Hopefully better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, I think Dyson, you know, will probably do a better job, assuming they get to the point of actually, you know, having a vehicle done and, and ready for production, they will probably do a better job of actually manufacturing and, and delivering those vehicles. Uh, yeah, but it better be a game changer. And so, you know, there's been all this talk that they'd come out with a solid state battery. So if they come out with something that moves, you know, this electric vehicle game forward, then they've got a chance. Okay, so, so, so what, is this, what does a solid state battery do for you? it drastically reduces the cost and size of the battery, drastically. In, in theory. In theory, right. Okay. Assume, assuming you can actually build it in scale. Mm -hmm. um, and it also allows for much faster charging and, it should, and the battery should be more durable over time. You know, one of the issues not today- Not burst into flames. Yeah, I mean, one of, one of the issues yeah. today with, with existing batteries uh, is you know if you charge them too fast they overheat and you know then the the electrolyte starts to evaporate and and you get into all kinds of problems with a solid state so battery those, that, those, that those so many computers of uh yeah. days gone by that were yeah or even even batteries to, in today you know the galaxy note 7 a couple of years ago yeah. from samsung i mean there's you know there's been there's always been issues with batteries when you charge them too fast a solid state battery resolves a lot of that because it you know it's the electrolyte is actually a solid material it's a ceramic material yeah here we got a graphic up right on, uh, the the, the problem right the problem um that you know from talking to to battery experts that i've heard is that while they're able to manufacture you know individual cells and they work they produce power the the solid state electrolyte material is not as conductive and so it doesn't make as much power mm -hmm. and so you know and and manufacturing it is um is 
complicated. And so um, they still haven't figured out how to scale up production to make a powerful enough battery to actually be useful to propel a car. Mm -hmm. And you know, Henrik Fisker has also talked about you know, having solid state batteries in his e-motion car that he promises for 2020. I, I have a feeling the guy who invented the, uh, the bagless vacuum cleaner is probably a little closer than the guy who designed the Karma to uh, achieving this. But that's, <laughs> yeah. that's just me. Yeah. Well, and, and you just, you know, the funny it, thing is both of them have connections back to Ann Arbor uh, with SACT-3, because mm -hmm. um, Dyson bought SACT-3 and um, uh, Fisker's lead battery person is a former SACT-3 uh, mm -hmm. co-founder. So it's, you know, th there's both, both of them have connections back to the same roots, although there's been some reports <laughs> one that- One owns the company and one has an employee. Yeah, yeah well, there, I mean, there, there's also, there's been some reports over the past year that Dyson was maybe backing away from some of the SACT-3 technology that it, they were having issues. Well, I, I, I read a little bit more deeply into that, and it turned out that some of the patents that SACT-3 was selling to Dyson actually belonged to the University of Michigan. Oh, okay. Not to SACT-3, because if you remember, mm -hmm. it, it started yeah, up. Exactly it was a startup was, yeah. that spun out of the right. uni university. So some of the early work was actually owned by uh, uh, okay. uh, U of M and Dyson went, oh, uh, we're not paying you for mm -hmm. this. Uh, and, and, but you're right, there was a, a couple of other patents, but Dyson came out and said, hey, wait, make no mistake about it. We're taking these patents in-house. We think this, this is very promising technology. And, and just as a, as a follow-up tip for the, the whole issue of these batteries lighting on fire, um, I'd like to do a public service and say, do not smoke a cigarette while you're pumping fuel into your vehicle. Just, just saying. <laughs> okay, very we, good point. We, we got three comments from journal uh, from uh, the audience here that we got to get to, and then we got to take a quick break. But Moses Fridman says maybe Dyson's car will be self-cleaning. David Go uh, Glattfeld. <laughs> that would says, actually be great for autonomous mobility services. Because well, they're going to need to be cleaned on a regular basis. So yeah, they, right. If you can have, right. if they can build a vacuum right, right. into right. it, better than that vacuum in the Pacifica battle. or the uh, Odyssey. Okay, yeah. hold on here, because David uh, Glattfeld. He says Dyson will make a great autonomous street cleaner, and NC wrote in to say life sucks. Go to Dyson. Ooh. <laughs> anyway, we're going to take a quick break right now and uh, give a shout out to our good friends and sponsors at Lear and Bridgestone. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts and speed alerts, all delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. All right, we're back talking about all things automotive. Uh, I know you got another topic there, Gary, but we've gotten a couple of phone calls. Carmen, let's bring the first one of them in. Uh, this is Clem Zerovsky, Delmont, Pennsylvania. With Ford's financial problems, I see today, should NASCAR be worried that they may cut back on their racing programs? Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for that, Clem. Uh, Ford was downgraded by Moody's. It's only one notch above junk bonds right now. Not a good sign for the company. So why did they do that? Why did Moody's do it? Because Ford's sales and profits have plummeted in China. It's gone from making money in Europe to losing money in Europe. It shows no sign of turning around at South American operations, which continue to bleed red ink. And uh, They're facing a, a bunch of pretty significant restructuring costs as well. And, and all that. So you put that all together and Moody said, woo, this doesn't look good. And we don't see them turning this around for another couple of years at the earliest. So that's why they downgraded it. So to the, to the question of NASCAR, so, so, so basically you've got Ford, Chevrolet, and Toyota in the, in the series. Um, you know, I, I, I've got to believe that to the extent that they want to sell F-150s, and I've got to believe that a reasonable percentage of the people who are, are NASCAR fans also have a truck in their driveway. I, I think that they would stick in that, and uh, and and they would they would continue on. Yeah, I don't think they'll probably stick with NASCAR for a while. Um, you know, I would be I wouldn't be surprised if you know once the the current Ford GT racing program you know commitment ends at the end of 2019, if that 
goes away. Um, there has been some talk that they might do a, an IMSA DPI program, but I think that that's probably not going to happen now. Uh, probably not now because IMSA not and, until the next generation of cars. Yeah, but uh, Ford is very interested in mm -hmm. going back to Le Mans for the overall win, not right. just for a GTLM class win. Yeah, but that's going to depend a lot on what those rules end up looking right. like. Yeah. Why did Dodge leave NASCAR? I don't. I don't remember why they left. Um, they were. They were struggling a little bit, and most of the teams that were using Dodge vehicles had switched over to GM or Ford anyway, or mm -hmm. Toyota. Um, so they were down to only a couple of teams. I, and they, I, I, I think might they, say even only one team. It might, it might be just one team, yeah. yeah. And so I think, I think Penske was, may have been the last one that was still with them. Hmm. Um, and so they said, okay, you know, it's not worth it for us for just, you know, just for one team. Uh, plus, you know, this was what uh, was it? I can't remember if it was before or after the bankruptcy. It was after the bankruptcy, yeah. as I recall. So, you know, I think, you know, they were also facing some pretty significant debt loads, you know, some financial issues at that point, you know, during the right. merger of FCA, um, and they decided to pull the plug on the program. Right, but I guess you could never say never in this industry, right? I mean, yeah. you, the Ford could make the announcement before the show's over, that, that, you know, we're done. <laughs> but I think you're right. I think they'll stick with it. Hey, we got another uh, phone call here. Let's bring that one in too, Carmen. Hi, John, Gary, invited guests. This is Dale Leonard out of Cleveland, Ohio. I know the whole show uh, is about autonomy, but I just got to tell you, I got to give you a little joke for the show today. <laughs> in my protest against autonomy, I just bought a 25-year-old Ford Ranger that's been in storage for 10 years, that's a manual transmission. Take care, guys. <laughs> okay. Wonderful show. Thanks Bye -bye. For, for, for what it's worth. Thanks for that, Dave. I, I write and talk about autonomous and connected cars all day as part of my job, and I drive a 28-year-old car as well. So. Yeah. So, so, you know, <laughs> I, I was... Manual transmission. It, it's interesting. So I, I actually, when I was driving home from the airport yesterday and I was listening to WWJ, who did I hear on the radio? I heard John. And, and you were doing your, your automotive report and talking about the decline in manual transmissions that Edmund's study said that 2% of the vehicles that are available today are manual transmissions. Yeah. And, uh, They're it, going away. So, you know, I, I was thinking about that. And you know what occurred to me is, is the fact that if we look at the greatest um, number of vehicles that are having the greatest number of sales, crossovers and SUVs and pickup trucks, right? Of those three categories, I'll bet you would have a hell of a time trying to find a manual transmission in an SUV or a crossover. Not in this country. You wouldn't there, find so one. So you wouldn't well, find one. So, so one, of, one of the few that still is available with a manual is the Jeep Wrangler. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. So, so I mean, it, it's, it, it occurs to me that as, as more of those vehicles are sold, the, the decline in the number of, of manual transmissions that will even be available. Oh, yeah. And, you know... It, Believe me, I know this from experience. Try selling a car with a manual transmission. I don't mean as a dealer. I mean as a used car. Yeah. Right. As soon as you know, people go, hey, I see that you got the car for sale. Can you tell me about it? And first thing I'll tell them is, yeah, it's got a manual. Hmm. Oh, so, oh, that's what they all say. Yeah. But, but again, there oh. are, <laughs> I've done that several times over the years. But again, I mean, so there, but there are still companies that are sticking. I mean, so, so the aforementioned uh, 2019 Kia Forte is, is available with a manual transmission. Yeah, but again, these are vehicles that are sold around the world. And in certain markets, Latin America, places of Asia, manuals still are in high demand. And so it's easy enough for them to say, yeah, okay, let's spend the money and get it certified through the EPA. Because you've got to certify your manual differently than uh, mm -hmm. uh, your automatic. And I don't know what the, the, the number is now offhand of what it takes to certify a car. It's not a huge number, but you know, if companies can avoid the cost, they'll avoid it. But that's the only place that you'll see uh, manual transmissions in mass market cars. They'll still be available in Camaros and Mustangs and Corvettes and, and that sort of thing. But they're starting to disappear from Porsches and mm -hmm. other cars as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, Audi just announced that you know, they're going to be phasing out manuals in, in North America. They've got a last special edition of the A4. Right. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're, they're going away everywhere. And, in fact, these days it's actually more challenging, uh, more technically challenging to certify a manual to meet current emissions and fuel economy standards. Yeah. Uh, because with an automatic, with modern electronically controlled automatics, 
they they can really manage optimize you know the all the shift points and everything to to really hit all the the points they have to hit in the in the drive cycle and get the most fuel economy they can out of it with a manual it's a lot harder to do that yeah and and, and look what's flipped and that I had that in my report is not that long ago automatics were more expensive they were typically a thousand dollar option and they didn't get as good a fuel economy mm -hmm. flip that around today and manuals are more expensive in many cases you pay for that and guess what they don't get as good a fuel economy as the automatics and so I mean I, I hate to say it as somebody who not only loves to drive a manual I love heel and toe shifting and really get pleasure out of doing that but it, it, it this is an endangered species. Okay, so so the number of people that know how to drive a manual transmission is plummeting, right? Correct, right. Okay, so at some point it's going to be infinitesimal, it really won't matter. So this this leads me to a question of, okay, we've been talking all, all about autonomy here. Are we going to get to the point in the not too distant future where people won't even have driver's licenses? Yeah, absolutely. Eventually, yes, but it's going to it's going to take a, a long while before we get there. What's a long while? Uh, at least 20 years, 25 years. Yeah, I, I'd go along with that. Although in certain areas, it, it's going to happen yeah. In, in yeah, very I mean, quickly. Certain, certainly in, urban, in some urban areas, well, it's going to happen. Ask how many people in Manhattan have a driver's license. Uh, yeah. You'll be surprised at how And many we don't have Manhattan. autonomous cars there yet. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. There's, yeah a, a lar large proportion of people in Manhattan don't drive at all. Right. You know, they just take the subway or cabs or Right. And so, so the number of cab drivers and Uber drivers and Lyft drivers in New York City will go down because they'll be replaced by mm -hmm. uh, robots. Yep. And, uh, yeah. Um, Eventually, so. yeah. So. Hey, we got some more questions here. Arno, Arno Schmidt wants to know, any idea what Ford pays to be in NASCAR every year? I'm sure it's in the millions. It's in the tens of millions for, to, for a manufacturer to run a NASCAR program because they're not only doing technical support for their teams, but also all kinds of sponsorship efforts and, and contingency programs. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's in the tens of millions. Pro probably full... I would say approaching 100 million annually. That much? Yeah. Oof. Wow. I had no idea. Win on Sunday, buy on Monday. Yeah. Jansky says, I want to see heads up display in NASCAR. Wouldn't it help those guys so much with drafting? <laughs> I don't know if it would help with drafting, but uh, heads up display is not a bad idea for race cars. You know, instead of having to look down at your gauges, just have them on the window. Well, well I mean, in most modern, most modern race cars, <laughs> they effectively have a heads-up display anyway because the display is usually built into the steering wheel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, especially if you look at um, sports cars and, you know, Formula One and Indy cars, the way they sit, you know, they sit so low, the steering wheel is up pretty high. So it's... It's almost, they're not almost really looking sight. down at the almost display sight. anyway. Yeah. And I think for NASCAR, I mean, who, who was suggesting on the show, we, we had someone on the show, um, one of our journalistic colleagues was basically saying, you know, they had to go back to, to real stock cars that are just, just basically street cars and, you know, get rid of all this, this well, technology stuff. Just, I'm all for just, it. Just go for it. I'm all yeah. for it. And I, I, I think you could... Bring back Smokey Eunuch. Have, right a, there, there have you a couple of crates of liquor in the back, you know, and uh, just like real stock car driving. Hey, NC wrote in. I love his comment. He says, we can love classic cars and AVs. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm with him on that. And, and classic yeah. cars may be all that exists after we have <laughs> AVs. Right. Let's see. Uh, Scott C. says, the telecommunications world is going to grow as cars get smarter. Look at SoftBank owner Masayoshi Son investing in GM Cruise right now, and he's just waiting for government approval of Sprint and T-Mobile. So, yeah, th th he makes a good point. Not only we're going to see a convergence of the automotive world with the tech world, it's going to be with the telecommunications world as yeah, well. Yeah, well, and, and the SoftBank Vision Fund that, that he's referring to is a venture fund uh, that Masayoshi San controls. And they, you know, Uber is just one, or GM Cruise is just one of their many investments. Last year they bought 20% of Uber. Um, they own huge stakes in Didi in China, Grab, a whole bunch of other mobility service companies and companies in doing various elements of the uh, you know, mobility ecosystem from sensors to software and all kinds of other stuff. So they're, you know, they they clearly see, you know, this as, you know, they see the synergies in all this and bringing it all together. Well, as you, as you've said many times, John, I mean, the, the, whole, the whole play here is going to be the data, right? 
Yep. So how does how does the data get off of that vehicle? Yeah. Oh, that's right. It goes through the telecommunications <laughs> system. So so aren't they going to charge a toll on the uh, data oh, flow yeah. if not if not uh, absolutely own it themselves? Or, or, or e even if it's not a toll, even if they just say you know we want to divert some of that you know and you can have it back, but we want to scrape. Some we we want to have we want to have access to that data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you know all that data is going to go into various aggregators and and they'll be looking at all of it you know looking for insights and that for ways that they can make money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Look, we've burned up an hour. We didn't even get to chat, talk about uh, my test drive of the Tesla no, Model we X. We're, wow, we're this gonna is, have to this do is, that. This is like the second or third show in a row that we haven't talked about Tesla. <gasps> <laughs> well, maybe next week because uh, the audience should know I got a chance to test drive a Model X and I was thoroughly impressed. And you drove the Model 3 with Sandy. I, I did, but you know, dr driving it for a little bit just around is not the same thing as taking it home, you know, having it, you know, several days in a row, going downtown. I went to the, the supercharger station in Livonia, a bunch of other stuff, and we, we should really do a deep dive into that because I got it. To, it changed my mind a lot about Tesla. And then you can tell us your leaf story that. Uh, oh, my. We, yeah. 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 <laughs> we'll, we'll do that, too, sometime. Maybe next week. Maybe not. <laughs> Anyway, Sam Abuselman, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, and it was great having uh, David Shutt here talking yeah. about what SAE is doing. So thank you all, and uh, please join us again here next week. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems, and by Borg Warner propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy-efficient world. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv. Completely unrelated thing. I thought this was rather surprising. Um, that so Jeremy Clarkson, James May, and uh, Richard Hammond, the the money they're losing on Drive Tribe. Yeah, yeah. The what? So so they they create so so you know they're they're doing the grand tour. Yeah. You know now on on Amazon since they they're no longer doing uh, um, not on the, the, BBC. the BBC show in, in, in anymore. And so they started this this web presence called. Um, Drive Tribe, all one word, Drive Tribe. And in, in two years, they've lost $16 million on this thing. Man. For a tech startup, that's peanuts. <laughs> but, I mean, <laughs> I mean, think about that. I mean, so, so you have these, these three celebrity guys who, who are revered by, by gearheads everywhere who start this thing, and they're losing $16 million on it? What what is it? It's it's okay. Launched in November 2016, Drive Tribe was designed with elements akin to Facebook and some other social media platforms, permitting users to join different tribes and post for, photos and videos, as well as read content crafted created car specifically for the site, network. including car and racing news stories. How can you lose that much money? They're they're saying that they lost most of it on administrative expenses, and Ro royalties paid to May Clarkson and Hammond. And uh, so they, they lost uh, 4.2 million pounds, not dollars, pounds in their first year, and 8.3 million pounds in its second year. And uh, who's funding this? Probably Amazon. I don't know. Oh, oh maybe. Oh. But uh, so of the money spent, 7.73 million pounds was reportedly devoted to administrative expenses, and 3.8 million pounds was spent on a staff of 44 people. 44 people to run a website? <laughs> no wonder they're losing that much money. There you go. There it is. Drive Prime. Yeah. But uh, I looked at it when it first launched. Didn't seem particularly compelling. Never went back. So, so, so there you go. Then. So, I mean, but th doesn't that sort of portend, I mean, not good things for some, you know, automotive websites going oh, forward? Oh, yeah. I well, mean, it's already happened. Uh, yeah, I mean, you've got these celebrities can't do it. Well, I, you know, look, uh, and I don't want to name Car and Driver, you know, laid off 13 people a few weeks ago. Yeah. You know, from all, almost all from the digital side. Hmm. And uh, that's it, is these, what had been magazines have been largely unsuccessful in converting themselves into car buying portals. 
and uh, and that's why you're seeing these kinds of layoffs and why you know the these guys in England are losing so much money. It, it it's not working. Mm -hmm. But they're starting in China, and so they're gonna they're gonna have salvation there. So <laughs> the, the three guys will. Uh... I don't know. Well, they were here in Detroit in June. I don't know if you know. They were they were shooting. They were here for several days, um, shooting the stuff. Show. Yeah, Grand doing Tour. doing a segment for the season three of Grand Tour. Um, I was at a dinner um, during ITS America with uh, some guys from Qualcomm, mm -hmm. and uh, Hammond and May came in and sat down at the table next to us. They were they were at the Foundation Hotel. Mm -hmm. And they were here for about three or four so days. So they were just there. They weren't at your dinner. They, no. They were at their dinner. They were at their dinner. They were eating dinner mm -hmm. next, at the next table over mm -hmm. with their crew. Hmm. Well, good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for having me on again. Yeah. It was fun. Yeah.